Well, greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well today. Today we are going to do things a little bit different. But before we get into it, a couple links. As you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, and my merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. The links to Patreon and PayPal are in the description below. My merch is displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, the links to which are also in that description below. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support this channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe, click the like button, and please leave a comment. It really does help, and guys, it definitely matters. And now, everyone, I have taken far, far too much of your time. Let's get on with today's upload, shall we? Like I said, we're going to do things just a little different, and with the anticipation of the lab results, which I'm expecting, and so is my friend, the next day or two for those results to come back to us, I figured, hey, about a year, no, two years ago, wow, time really does fly with this channel, about two years ago, I had read a book, and it blew me away and it really did focus on what life was like back before technology before you know when humans were not even a thought of being an apex predator we were just little peons. And there is a book by a very interesting author, uh, Danny Van Drimini. And the book, once I read it, it blew my mind. I really was shocked, to be honest with you. Um, the information, the theories, his opinions really started putting puzzle pieces where they shouldn't be, but the puzzle pieces fit. And like I said, with the anticipation, I'm going to share this with you guys. Uh, a few of you may have heard it, but it is really some fabulous information. Uh, also, I'm going to share with you guys some three very intriguing photographs that are new to me and when things are new to me I'm hoping they're new to you I, I see in the comment section sometimes when I play a video people are like that was that was online 15 years ago I can't believe you're playing it well there's not that many videos of these creatures stalking around so I figure if I'm gonna do a video I'm going to share some video clips. Necessarily doesn't mean that they're new to me. Uh, I don't really think there is a video clip or a news article that I don't catch, to be honest with you. Um, I'm constantly scouring the internet and just really pounding away uh, looking for information and research on these things. So... But these three photos are very, very amazing. But let's get into this scientific theory. And I am so excited about these samples coming back. I really cannot wait. And I just, I have no idea what to expect at this point. A lot of people are like, oh, Jeff, it's going to come back this. It's going to come back that. Lack of faith. That's all I have to say. Lack of faith. I have the utmost faith in what my friend and I did and how we did it. So I'm hoping that we are hit with something that my friend and I had talked about or a very interesting 
just mind-blowing result. I don't know. But let's get into this, so. When orcs were real, the ancient struggle for Homo sapiens to rule the earth. Every human culture has believed in the existence of other beings, monstrous humanoids, sapient but inhuman. They have gone by different names, boogeyman, bugbear, cyclops, giant, jotun, ogre, ani, troll, yeti, dogman, and more. But they are always feared, lurkers in the shadows, threats to the clan tribe or hearth. Dungeons and dragons didn't create these monsters, and despite ongoing controversies, they don't represent anything modern. Humanity's legendary heroes have been fighting these monsters since time immemorial. The real question is why? Why does every civilization have similar myths? Why does every culture have legends of monstrous humanoids? And why are they always depicted as fearsome and dangerous? Because the legends were real. Dogmen, Bigfoot, and whatever are real. That is at least an argument offered by Danny Van Drimini in his book, Them and Us, How Neanderthal Predation Created Modern Humans. Van Drimini is a heterodox thinker, and his argument is well outside of mainstream view, so before we delve into Van Drimini's book, let's discuss what the mainstream view is. The mainstream view. Archaeologists and geneticists agree that humanity co-evolved and interbred with similar species. We nowadays have abundant, essentially irrefutable, archaeological and genetic evidence for the existence of multiple human-like species within the Paleolithic and Neolithic eras. These include Neanderthal, Denisovian, and Hobbit, and several recently discovered and uncategorized species such as the Nesher Ramla Homo, in Israel. New human-like species are being discovered all the time. In fact, as I'm narrating this right now, there is probably a Chinese archaeologist discovering one more. Yet none of these archaic humans or humanoids survive today. Not a single one. All have gone extinct, vanishing save for traces of artifacts and bones in our wilderness and fragments of DNA in our genome. What happened to them all? Here, disagreements begin. The possible causes of extinction identified by scientists include extinction from parasites and pathogens, extinction from interbreeding into humanity, extinction from inability to adapt to climate change, extinction from natural catastrophe, and extinction by war with human. The latter view, which suggests that the humans race brutally extinguished another sapient primate it faced, was proposed by French paleontologist Marceline Biol back in 1912. It was then promptly ignored for many decades, as explained in the Archaeology of Warfare and Mass Violence in Ancient Europe. Archaeologists were increasingly aware that they had underestimated the social impact of collective violence. Sites like Ribmont Kessel, Mount Bernorio, and Calcris confront us in a poignant way with the cruelties of war and mass violence in late prehistoric and early historic times. There is a growing critique that archaeology has marginalized violence and presented too pacified a view of the past. Actually, it wasn't just archaeology that was biased. Academics of all sorts hate violence, and for decades they systematically marginalized it from the explanations of events. Only within the last 20 years has mainstream academics and scientists accepted the ubiquity of violence in man and his closest kin. Anthropologists systematically underestimated the violence of indigenous peoples, perpetuating the myth of the noble savage. Now they have admitted the level of violence in prehistoric times and non-state societies was much higher than today. 
Biologists believe that chimpanzees were only violent because of interactions with humans. Now they have confirmed that violence is innate to chimpanzees who routinely, routinely engage in war and murder. Historians argued that Indo-European language culture bloodlines spread through migration and trade. Now, they've acknowledged it was through large-scale violent conquest. With these developments in mind, mainstream academics have finally began to accept that human beings drove the Neanderthal to extinction through war. Nicholas R. Longrich, a senior lecturer in evolutionary biology and paleontology, at the University of Bath presents an excellent summary of the current consensus. To war is human, and Neanderthals were very like us. We are remarkably similar, and our skull and skeletal anatomy and share 99.7% of our DNA. Behaviorally, Neanderthals were astonishingly like us. The archaeological record confirms Neanderthals lived. Lives were anything but peaceful. The best evidence that Neanderthals not only fought but excelled at war is that they met us and were not immediately overrun. Instead, for about 100,000 years, Neanderthals resisted modern human expansion. For thousands of years, we must have tested their fighters. And for thousands of years, we kept losing. Finally, the stalemate broke and the tide shifted. We don't know why. Is it possible the invention of superior ranged weapons, bows, spear throwers, throwing clubs, let lightly built Homo sapiens harass the stocky Neanderthal from a distance using hit and run tactics or perhaps better hunting and gathering techniques, let sapiens feed bigger tribes creating numerically superior in battle? Ultimately, we won, but this wasn't because they were less inclined to fight. In the end, we likely just became better at war than they were. The mainstream view then is that Neanderthals were behaviorally and physically much like humans, made war much like humans, and were eventually defeated by superior technology and numbers, much as Europeans defeated indigenous peoples throughout history by superior technology and numbers. In other words, we killed off Fred Flintstone, the heterodox way. Let us now consider Danny Van Drummany's view. Van Drummany agrees with the mainstream that Neanderthals were driven to eventual extinction by way of war with Homo sapiens. Where he parts his ways with the mainstream is in his assessment of what Neanderthals were like. Van Drummany shows that Neanderthals were apex predators. Analysis of isotopes of bone college has shown that Neanderthal diet was 97% meat. They're estimated to have eaten 4.1 pounds of fresh meat per day. Ample evidence exists to show that they used stone-tipped wooden spears to hunt. From the bones littered in their caves, we know Neanderthals hunted woolly mammoth, giant cave bear, woolly rhinos, bison, wolves, and even cave lions, the most dangerous and lethal animals on earth. Neanderthals were cannibals. A number of Neanderthal sites reveal bone that have been cut and cracked open to extract marrow. While this hypothesis was initially rejected, a recent find in El Cedron in Spain revealed numerous Neanderthal skeletons with the unmistakable marks of butchery by cannibals wielding hand axe, knives, and scrapers. Neanderthals had more robust bones and heavier musculature than human Homo sapiens. They weighed 25% more. They were so heavily muscled that their skeletons had to develop extra thick bones. One of the most characteristic features of the Neanderthal is the exaggerated massiveness of their trunk and limp bone. All of the preserved bones suggest a strength. Seldom attained by modern human. And right here, is where Van Drimini really unleashes some very interesting theory backed by science. So please listen to this part very, very carefully. Quoting paleoanthropologist Eric Trinkus, 
A healthy Neanderthal male could lift an average NFL linebacker over his head, throw him through the goalposts. Neanderthals also evolved extremely thick skulls, postcranial hyperrobosity. That protected them from close quarter confrontation with prey. They all had kipothesis with hunched backs that gave them a distinct profile and gait. Neanderthal teeth was twice as large as human teeth. According to 2008 anthropologist research, their mouths could open much wider than the human mouths, enabling them to take extremely large bites, judging by the size of their jaw, they had tremendous bite force. Neanderthals evolved in the Ice Age Europe and had specific adaptations to that climate. They had shorter limbs, larger noses, compact torsos. Most importantly, they were covered in thick fur. Since no Neanderthal could ever survive, this point cannot be proven. But Van Drummany points out that every primate except Homo sapiens is covered with fur. And that every cold adapted mammal during the Ice Age had thick fur, including mammals that were hairless in Africa, such as the elephant and rhinoceros. There is no reason to believe Neanderthals were hairless except for our desire for them to look like us. The only way Neanderthals could have survived in the Ice Age without fur was if they made thick protective clothes. Archaeologist Mark White points out, Neanderthal clothing would have needed to be more than ragged loincloth of popular depiction. Some form of tailoring would be required, but Neanderthal sites have yielded no evidence of needlecraft technology. They were not making clothes because they had fur. Neanderthal skulls were extremely large eye sockets, suggesting large eyes. That, in turn, suggests that Neanderthals were nocturnal. However, the large eyes pose a problem, as Ice Age Europe would have presented Neanderthals with blinding sunlight reflecting off the snow. Van Drimini suggests that the Neanderthals had vertically aligned slit pupils which enabled them to use the full diameter of the lens in low light while shutting out bright light by day. Nocturnal primates such as the Rias monkey and owl monkey have large eyes with vertically aligned slit pupils. Van Drimini suggests Neanderthals also had a tapetum lucidum like a cat that made their eyes shine in the dark and had a dark scarilla like other primates. Neanderthals had a distinct facial proganthicism that featured large, broad noses. Van Drimini argues that this suggests a Neanderthal snout with a dog-like nose designed for scent hunting. This was useful during nocturnal raids. Neanderthals did not speak human language, he quotes, a September 2008 talk presented to the American Association of Physical Anthropologists. Their large nasal cavity would have decreased the in intelligible of vowel-like sounds. And in a combination of a long face, short neck, Unequally proportioned vocal tract and large nose made it highly unlikely that Neanderthals would have been unable to produce quantal speech. Neanderthals' tongues were also not shaped to speak clearly. Overall, the evidence suggests a creature that spoke with a deep timber with lots of guttural sounds. The Neanderthal that Van Drimini describes is thus a terrifying creature, a hunched, cannibalistic predator with large, shiny eyes and an animalistic snout covered in thick fur, massive muscles built for close combat, hunting by night with brutish, guttural voice and a large mouth with huge teeth and powerful jaws. It did not look like Frank Flintstone. That, my friends, is a dogman or a bugbear or an ogre, whatever it is. It's been apparently appearing in our minds and myths and legends for thousands of years. It's our great enemy. Now, you will learn why we fear the night. According to them and us, Neanderthal and human were predator and prey. And we were the prey. The Neanderthals came upon a hapless humans by night, slew our man, carried off our women, 
how do you think the Neanderthal DNA got into our genome? And they kept doing it generation after generation. Not only were they stronger, faster, tougher than Homo sapiens, the Neanderthals were just as smart. Under assault by these flesh-eating monsters, the human race almost went extinct. Only becoming the apex predator ourselves did we survive. We became the greatest killers the world has ever known. Because if we hadn't, we would have died out. Is Vendremini's theory correct? He cites a number of anomalies in the genetic makeup and fossil record of human beings as evidence. Let's start with the genetic makeup. The most remarkable thing about the human genome is that it is not very diverse, according to geneticist Pascal Gagnou. Humans have by far the least amount of genetic variations of any primate species. We actually found that one single group of 55 chimpanzees in West Africa has twice the genetic variability of all humans, he reports. Another scientist, Bernard Wood, says that the amount of genetic variation that has accumulated in humans is just nowhere compatible with the age of our species. To explain it, we must have come within a cigarette paper's thickness of becoming extinct, he says. Dr. David Reich of Harvard Medical School calculated that the population of humans dropped to as few as 50 individuals. Something terrible happened to the human race. When did this population bottleneck occur? A number of teams have analyzed mutation rates to find out. The mutation rate in our Y chromosome suggests the bottleneck occurred 37 to 49,000 years ago. The mutation rate of a single noctiloid promorphism suggests 48,000 years. Dr. Reich's study claims 27 to 53,000 years ago. Now let's turn to the fossils, specifically the collection known as the Quasse skull fossils found in present-day Israel. The Quasse skull represent among the earliest known population of Homo sapiens. The fossils first appeared in the Levant region around 125,000 years ago. After tens of thousands of years occupying the Levant, the Quasse Savant or Quasse skull began to disappear from the fossil record around 80,000 years ago. For the next 30,000 years, that is around 80 to 50,000 years ago, the fossils in the Levant region are mostly Neanderthal. After that, the Neanderthal fossil began to disappear from the Levant and Homo sapien fossils began to reappear. The apparent timeline of Neanderthal invasion matches the apparent timeline of our genetic bottleneck. Neanderthals invaded the Levant around 80,000 years ago and proceeded to drive the human race to the brink of doom. The Neanderthal is gone now, but we endured. While we live, he does too. For we still carry fragments of their DNA, and perhaps we carry the memory of of our species' greatest foe in our myths, our legends, our Jungian collective unconsciousness, as Van Drimini writes. If early Greek, Roman, Norse, and Chinese mythologies are anything to go by, the legend spun by early humans center around a heroic human, almost always a man, who was pitted against an ugly, evil, cruel monster with superhuman strength, this universal mythic monster is usually male, unvariably wild, hairy, dangerous, and unclothed. Uncouth, excuse me. Often it is half man, half animal, and tends to live in the dank forests or dark caves. Or emerge from the underworld under the cover of darkness. The monster is usually kidnaps and ravishes innocent maidens fair princesses, whom he drags back to his shadowy lair. It commonly feeds on human flesh, devours children, and stalks the night. That's all modern myths, or, you know, myths of Greek, Roman, things that we think about when we're kids, the monsters that lurk in the woods. <laughs> 
What a what an amazing friggin' essay this is. It, it just blew me away the second I read it, and I was like, whoa. Two years ago I read this. Van Drimini, the things that he says, and he he really stands by his beliefs. The the ones that just caught me off guard were how he pretty much described a dog man this one paragraph and actually it's two paragraphs that really to me say the neanderthal that van drimini describes is thus a terrifying creature a hunched cannibalistic predator with large shining eyes an animalistic snout covered by thick fur and massive muscles built for close combat hunting by night with a brutish, guttural voice, a huge mouth with huge teeth and powerful jaws. This universal, mythic monster is usually male, invariably wild, hairy, dangerous, and uncouth. Often it's half man, half animal, and tends to live in dark, dank forests and caves. The second I read this, mind-blowing essay article i bought van drimini's book physically the audio and on my kindle because this is the only scientific backed theory that really shows possibly who or what the dog man is undeniably it's a theory but it's backed by science and it's very very creepy scary and mind-blowing to me it is i don't know about you but to me this really really solidified things so just something to think about kick around in your brain all right, let's get into some pictures. So the first photo that we are going to look at, <clears throat> it appears that there is a coyote. And <clears throat> it looks too big to be a fox in this black shadow behind it. You can see that it looks like it has ears. Um, it's much bigger than the coyote and it looks like it has shoulders with a arm. I'm really not sure where this was taken. Possibly to me, it looks like a trail cam. I'm not sure why we're not seeing eye shine from the creature, but it does not look to be imposed into the picture so I'm not sure it's it's interesting and it makes you think so pretty pretty cool photo the next photo is a trail cam you can see a deer quite evidently right there and then you see two eye shine behind it. Um, looks primate to me. I'm not sure what's going on with it. Um, it. It definitely is some sort of creature there. You can really look if you really look at it. But there is a attachment uh, there was an attachment to the photo. This image was shared in 2018 by Western Hunting Company with the following information. This trail cam pic was captured by a member of our team in Michigan. Needless to say, he's been carrying a firearm since. Hmm. Yeah, so very interesting photo. 
it does show, as we know, these creatures, Bigfoot, Dogmen, are very intelligent, tactically, uh, tactical hunters, and um, dangerous. So, all right, let's move on to the final photograph. Actually, with the final one, there's going to be two. The final photo is in two parts. Uh, if you're looking at it, you can see a guy on a quad. And <clears throat> he's going up this trail. There's a green circle with something coming up. It looks like behind him. He apparently in this photo, there is a caption that this guy... This guy's brother had taken the photo, and they had narrowly, um, he had narrowly missed getting attacked by this creature. Uh, not really sure. I did blow it up. That will be the second part of this picture, so let's look at that right now. So here are, actually blew it up twice, so we could look at it. Um, here is a blown up circle, circled version of whatever that is. And then in the original picture, which is too big to share on the screen that YouTube allows us, the blown up version that's on the picture is the next picture that you guys will see which is this photo it definitely does look like some sort of hairy humanoid i'm not sure it's a very interesting and compelling photo and i hope that you guys enjoy the breakdown of this photo because to me it's pretty interesting all three of these photos are interesting and compelling possible evidence of these creatures existence i'd like to thank everybody who watched this upload and i'd like to thank everybody for all of your support that you guys provide this channel uh, it really is felt the positivity and just the support is amazing. You guys really, really are the heart of this channel. So thank you. With that, my friends, I have nothing more to say except may the great spirit watch over us all. And may he guide us down that path that we call life. Stay safe. <laughs>